Pakistan, India, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, England, and Afghanistan are the test playing nations with an above 500 record in T20 internationals. There are a few teams that aren't there, of course. Ireland, Bangladesh, West Indies, and Sri Lanka. Of all of those teams, Sri Lanka is the closest to 50-50. And it might seem odd that they and the West Indies are that bad, being that they have won three World Cups between them, and Sri Lanka have made two other final appearances as well. This is the last knot. My dad told me to say this. But when you break it down, it becomes a lot more clear. If you look at T20 internationals from the start all the way through to Sri Lanka's win in 2014, they were the best team in the sport, winning almost two thirds of their games. And to cap that off with a World Cup was nearly perfect. Of course, then you have to look at the following few years where they went from one of the best teams to basically the worst. Technically Zimbabwe had them covered, but adjusting for ability, this is pretty horrendous. Sri Lanka won 28% of their games in this time, which in the random world of T20 internationals, it's almost impossible to be that consistently bad. And when you actually break down their games, they had decent wins in there. They beat India, Pakistan, South Africa, and the West Indies multiple times. So it gets even more confusing. But there is one thing that does make a little bit more sense when you start to think about all this, and that is the Sri Lanka Premier League. In 2011, the Sri Lankan Cricket Board started the SLPL, a T20 league that was supposed to be a huge deal for them. That year, they couldn't actually get the tournament up and running, which is probably the first sign it wasn't ideal. And realistically, the reason for that was it was absolutely terribly run as an organization. The SLPL sold their hosting rights to a company called Somerset Entertainment Ventures, which was a company that seemed like it was started in Singapore just far enough back to actually get the deal done. There was also a TV rights package that didn't really make any sense either. The story at the time was that the host broadcaster didn't actually have a way of broadcasting when they won their deal. There's something about that that doesn't add up. But the 2012 season went ahead. Sadly, the 2013 one was cancelled, and then the 2014 was as well. And that was it. The SLPL was one year in 2012. From then on in, T20 in Sri Lanka was pretty poor, if it existed at all. And while it might have been a coincidence that this is the period that Sri Lanka struggled, I don't think it was. And part of that reason is that that period from 2013 onwards is when the boom of professionalism really starts to hit T20. Sri Lanka still had enough players in other leagues up until that point, And they were still a big deal because of all their international success. But two things start to happen afterwards. Their main players age out and their next generation just doesn't appear good enough. And at least part of that has to be that they weren't playing in a strong local league. And so what happened next is basically what I showed you before, a huge drop off. They went from the best team to basically the worst. That is an extraordinary fall. There's some very Sri Lankan things that happen in this time as well. They have seven captains in seven years. Now, some of this is just that T20 international teams can be a little bit random. But there's also clearly no real idea of who is going to lead. And if they do have that idea, they don't keep it for very long. So the job goes to kind of whoever is available on the day, which is never a good idea. They also have a really similar churn on coaches. I'm not going to go through everyone who's coached Sri Lankan cricket, but I think the official number is 6 billion people. The most important thing is there really is no one in charge, no vision, no planning, and most importantly, no league. And yet in 2018, it is clear when you look at the players individually, there was talent there. But even when the players were chosen in other leagues, they struggled because your home league is where you fine tune your game. Playing internationals doesn't really allow for you to do that because you don't play enough. And so even the players in Sri Lanka with talent just never seem to make it in those overseas leagues. Q, our hero. The Lankan Premier League starts in 2020, eight years after its cousin left us with a single season. That year in the IPL, Usuru Undana played 10 matches. He was the only Sri Lankan to play a game that year in the IPL. And at that point, Udana was the 27th Sri Lankan player who'd ever played in the IPL. Of those first 27, only three had played their first season after 2014. It was Udana, Chimera, and Gunaratna. The pipeline just completely dried up. And it is really hard to be good at T20 cricket if your players aren't playing it much for their nation or at home. But it is also worth stating that there is no doubt they didn't have the same level of players that they did before. Vas, Murali, Malinga, Kumar, Mahela, they were not replaced. But there is a difference between having a down period and not producing anyone at all. This wasn't a simple lack of talent. It was systemic. 
the entire island didn't forget how to play cricket. And in 2022's IPL, wow, Hasaranga and Rajapaksa, Teek Shana, Chimira, Chimika Kunaratni, and Mathisa Patharana, all with teams. And that's the most in a very long time. Again, it could just be a coincidence that in 2020, the Lankan Premier League started and then suddenly in 2022, all these players are in the IPL. But it isn't just the IPL. We saw that Sri Lanka looked like a better international side at the last World Cup. Sure, some of that was beating up on lower ranked teams. But guess what? They weren't really doing that before. They were actually struggling against those sorts of teams. And then they go and win the Asia Cup as well. Like at a certain point, you have to admit that they are getting better. Though if you look at the win total of the team, it's not quite getting that pretty. In 2020, they lost all four of their international matches. 2021, they won eight from 20. But if you look just from that last World Cup onwards, certainly something is going great. And I don't just mean for Uganda, but huge shout out to Uganda here. So Sri Lanka since that last World Cup have been 50-50, which wouldn't be great for most teams and certainly not one who was one of the best teams of all time. But to Sri Lankan fans right now, this must feel like they've won the lottery. And while the Lankan Premier League is clearly a huge part of this, it should be pointed out that Sri Lanka are actually playing a lot more T20 internationals at the moment. Part of that was probably due to the back-to-back nature of the World Cups, so they had a focus. But historically, they've not played a lot of those matches. And in the last two years, they've played their most ever. And they haven't even finished this year yet, and there's a World Cup to come. And if you then throw in all the games from the Lankan Premier League, suddenly you're talking about that talent being brought through and actually developing, and not just being left to rot. And no one is expecting Sri Lanka to win this World Cup, or even to get back to where they were before 2014. But the signs are that they're at least making the most out of the players they currently have. And that is really the first step in a rebuild. And for the longest time, they weren't rebuilding. In fact, they hadn't even emailed an architect from what I could tell. But for the last year, they've looked competitive. And if nothing else, that's a huge win for them. 